So this reading is from a rabbinical wisdom tradition translated by Martin Buber and Olga Marx. <clears throat> a disciple asked Rabbi Schmelke, we are commanded to love our neighbor as ourself. How can I do this if my neighbor has wronged me? The rabbi answered, you must understand these words correctly. Love your neighbor like something which you yourself are. For all souls are one. Each is a spark from the original soul. And this original soul is wholly inherent in all souls, just as your soul is in all members of your body. Now, it may happen that your hand makes a mistake and hits you. But would you take a stick and punish your hand because it lacked understanding? And so increase your pain? It is the same if your neighbor who is of one soul with you, wrongs you because he does not understand. If you punish him, you only hurt yourself. The disciple asked, but if I see a man who's wicked before God, how can I love him? Rabbi Schmelke said, don't you know that the original soul came out of the essence of God that every human soul is a part of God. And will you have no mercy on God when you see that one of his holy sparks has been lost in a maze and is almost stifled? When I learned that I would be delivering my first sermon to an empty sanctuary, my first thought was, well, later in my career, when anyone asks about my first time preaching, I will be able to proudly tell them that absolutely no one stayed to hear the end of it. The thought did worry me, however. What would it feel like to step into this pulpit and not see anyone in the pews what would be going through my mind while speaking into an empty space? While reflecting on these questions and on questions like them, a quiet thought fizzled up to the surface. I am not speaking to an empty sanctuary at all. I am speaking not into an empty room, but to a congregation, to my community, to my friends and my family. And for that, I am grateful. This month's theme is integrity. I want you to sit with that word for a moment. Integrity. What does it call to mind? What or who does it make you think of? Does that word sit easily with you or not? I must admit, for me, the word itself seems almost imposing. Integrity. It brings to mind other terms such as steadfast, resolute, unbreakable. After all, if we say that an object, for instance, a teacup or a ship at sea, failed to retain its integrity, we mean that the object broke, perhaps by being dropped or by being steered into rocks. We are familiar with characters both in our lives and in our stories that embody a kind of moral unbreakability. The kind of people who, when all the chips are down, will always do the right thing, even when what exactly the right thing is, is unclear. Characters like these, 
who are often described as having great integrity, are folks whose personalities, stories, and wonderful works have, that have grown and grown in their retelling. They have taken on a kind of legendary status as people who remain unfazed in the face of great temptation and unaffected by moments of weakness. The great integrity then of such figures is as great as it is unreachable. This is true for one simple fact. We are not unbreakable. No one is. Acknowledging this one undeniable truth is frightening. It is difficult to sit comfortably with the fact that we will from time to time fall short, that we will on occasion fail and suffer breakage. But it is in this acknowledgement that we can find what it truly means to be a people of integrity. Of the stories told about characters of great integrity, one in particular has been on my mind as of late. The Abrahamic traditions all recognize the prophet Moses, but he holds a special prominence in the Jewish faith as the emblematic prophetic figure. Indeed, throughout the Hebrew Bible, called the Old Testament by Christians, Moses is the figure against whom all other prophets are compared. We are told at the end of the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, which supposedly details the last day in the life of Moses, that there had never been before a prophet like Moses, and that there had never been one like him since. But why? Why in a tradition that is rich and full of prophetic figures who speak truth to power and have intimate connections with the divine is Moses, singled out as a prophet like none other. He is not a powerful king like David, an unparalleled warrior like Samson, nor is he described as the wisest man like Solomon was in his time. Even in his ability to perform miracles, Moses is not alone. One of the few who comes closest to being the next Moses in the Hebrew Bible is the prophet Elijah, whose life is described in the books of Kings. Every element of Elijah's life, from the litany of miracles he performs to his visit to Mount Sinai, draws a direct parallel from him to Moses. But even Elijah, whose narrative mirrors that of Moses, falls short of his predecessor. Why? As the stories have it, it all comes down to a choice that each prophet had to make before God on Mount Sinai on behalf of their community. When Elijah fled to the mountain, God asked him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And Elijah responded, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. In other words, why are you here, Elijah? asked God. Because the people of Israel are broken, but I am not, said Elijah. Moses, though, received a different message from God and had a different response. I have seen this people, says the Lord to Moses, speaking of Israel. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. And of thee, I will make of thee a great nation." Presented with the opportunity to leave his imperfect community to a fiery fate and embrace a new nation of his very own, the thing that Elijah wished for, Moses prostrates himself before God and says, Turn, 
from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Moses says no to abandoning Israel. He says these people are not perfect. They are not unbreakable. They have made mistakes. Love them anyway. Love them anyway. And the story goes, the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses' integrity does not lie in the fact that he is unbreakable and perfect in contrast to those in his community. Indeed, later, Moses is barred entrance to the promised land because even he makes mistakes. Moses has integrity because through his works and his deeds, he recognizes that inconvenient truth about himself and about all people. All of us will suffer moments of weakness, of doubt, of breakage. Moses sees this, and he knows that it is okay. It is not despite our imperfection, but because of it, that we are worth saving, that we are worth loving, and that we are worthy of forgiveness. Because if we give ourselves the space necessary for healing, being broken is not the end of the story. We have the capacity to repair and to be repaired, allowing that reparation to occur. That is integrity. When I first arrived to this church this past October, I saw a great many things that made my heart happy. I saw the restored steeple reaching out over the town of Newburyport. I saw the sanctuary resplendent and full of smiling faces. I saw the Merrimack River ancient and quiet as it flowed eternally out to sea. But these were not that one thing that made me stop in my tracks. The sight that above all others assured me that this is a sacred and beautiful place was a flag. Hung on the front of the church, there it was, a Black Lives Matter flag, one like so many others, bold white text printed on a a background of black. Black lives matter. But this flag was also not like any other. Running across the flag like rivulets of water, like a network of veins, was rainbow tape patching it back together. In her paper, Exploring Japanese Art and Aesthetic as Inspiration for Emotionally Durable Design, Pui Ying Kwan describes what she sees as the primary failure of the human object relationship in our society. She writes, waste is a symptom of a failed relationship. Modern consumers are short distance runners who only stay for the getting to know you period when all is fresh new, and novel. So when an object, whether it is a chair, or a book, or a teacup, breaks for the first time, we tend to consider that breakage an ending. The object is over and done with. If it's not perfect, it's broken. If it's broken, it's not perfect. Hui Ying Quan reminds us that there are other ways to be in relationship with broken things. We don't have to give up on something the moment it fractures. 
She writes about the art of kintsugi, which means gold joining in the original Japanese. Kintsugi is said to date back to the 15th century when the Japanese shogun's favorite teacup broke. I want you to imagine a potter in her studio at her wheel. She spends all day at that wheel spinning teacup after teacup, producing a great number of perfect, identical cups. The next step, of course, is to bake these cups in a kiln so that they harden and are finished. But when this potter places her cups in the kiln, she also places a giant blob of unshaped clay right in the middle of all those cups. For those of you familiar with pottery, you know what happens when the kiln heats up. That blob of clay explodes like a bomb, sending shards of clay everywhere in the kiln, breaking all of the teacups before they even finish baking. This is by design. Later, when the potter removes those damaged, broken teacups from the kiln, she is waiting with a bowl full of sap from the urushi tree that has been mixed with powdered gold. Using this thick, syrupy, golden mixture, the potter pieces together the teacups one by one until she has finished, and before her is a sea of cups, each one different than the last, each cup a gleaming map of beautiful golden ribbons, marking the places where it had been previously damaged and, importantly, where that damage had been seen, tended to, and repaired. The rainbow tape on the Black Lives Matter flag outside our church is a sacred testament to this community's integrity. It is likely that someone intentionally tore that flag to send a message of hate and intolerance. And the flag was, in that moment, broken. Just as a society that allows that kind of hate to fester is broken. But we did not throw away that flag. We did not replace it. We did not give up on it, just as we did not give up on our larger community. We repaired the flag. We repaired it with rainbow bandages, beautiful badges of perseverance that say something was broken, but never irreparably. Everyone and everything has the capacity to rebuild and to be rebuilt. No one is beyond the limits of love. We did not give up on that torn flag. Why should we give up on our torn world? What does it mean when we ask ourselves to be a people of integrity, a community of integrity? It means that we accept with open hearts the truth that our souls are not perfect porcelain plaques to be protected at all costs from the roiling vicissitudes of life. But that we accept that we are always subject to change. That life has shifts and surges and, yes, tragedies. And it is these changes, good and get bad, that give us the chance to heal to grow as individuals, and to grow closer to each other. Moses knew this well. He experienced hardship and frustration from the actions of those he loved. And his story does not end with him entering the promised land. But what did Moses do when he learned he would not live to see his people finish their journey? He walked with them anyways. He walked with his perfectly imperfect people towards the rising dawn of a new day, a dawn 
that he would not personally witness. He walked with them, guided them, loved them, and even in his final hours had faith in them that they would continue to grow, to look after one another, and that they would all cross the River Jordan into a better tomorrow. It is as the poet Rumi tells us, your acts of kindness are iridescent wings of divine love, which linger and continue to uplift others long after your sharing. Amen.